master enthusiast. Um, in the early 1990s, I became involved in river restoration in Dorset. In the early days, comparatively speaking, of restoration projects on chalk rivers, and I've been involved mostly as an observer, but an occasional practitioner ever since. In the late 1990s, as a way of catalyzing grassroots, grassroots projects in this growing movement of river restoration, I co-founded what went on to become the Wild Trout Trust. I'm now its president, which means I don't do much except give the odd presentation. Much more recently, I've helped establish um, a Norfolk Rivers Trust, and from time to time, I advise WWF UK on their freshwater projects, particularly in relation to chalk streams, because I have a real passion for our English chalk streams, many of which flow, obviously, through areas of outstanding natural beauty. The Chilterns, the Kent Downs, the Wessex Downs, the North Norfolk Coastal Strip. And I particularly want to talk this afternoon about two recent uh, writing projects um, I've been engaged in, and a few thoughts that have grown out of them as they relate to this evolving world of river restoration. We are at a very exciting point in history in terms of river restoration, with funding available at a scale no one really dreamt of in the early days. And this presents us with great opportunities, which are matched all the way by great challenges. So, I recently wrote and then published a book called Silt Road, The Story of a Lost River. And it was um, uh, a lyrical exploration, I suppose, of the layered histories of water meadows and pleasure gardens, factories, mills, slums, shopping centers, and car parks that built one after the other to create a suburban landscape around a little Buckinghamshire chalk stream called the River Wye. And not long after I finished that work, I started on another project, which was a water framework directive catchment plan for a Norfolk chalk stream, the River Nile. This time I was writing a summary of the geography of the river, of the issues that were holding back its ecological condition, abstraction, say, or the extent to which the channel had been modified, all aimed at a timetable plan for its restoration, in inverted commas. So the two pieces of work couldn't have been more different, except that they each described a river. And yet, though they came at this common subject from different perspectives, for different reasons, the Book of Nature writing and the report for WWF and the Norfolk Rivers Trust both asked more or less the same two questions. How in this overcrowded and much altered landscape do we give rivers the room they need to express their true nature? And what exactly do we mean by restoration? What wilderness or man-made state do we aspire to? As part of the publicity surrounding the book, I was asked to do a Q&A interview for a freebie city newspaper. The questions demanded careful answers, in one of which I used the word palimpsest. And when the interview came out, at least three people emailed or texted me to congratulate me for getting the word palimpsest into Metro. <laughs> This was a little unfair on Metro, I thought, but perhaps I had used it in that way. People do tend to use so-called clever words, as if it had just fallen off the tongue and I'd known what it meant forever. In fact, it was a word I'd read here and there over the years, always guessing its meaning by context, until finally I looked it up and realised that it was a very good word to describe exactly what I was interested in. And so I used it, and thousands of Londoners thought, how pretentious. <laughs> But it is a good word. In fact, exactly the right word to describe the phenomenon that leads to those two questions. Panopsis comes from the Greek palin again and cestos rubs smooth, and it describes a manuscript on which the original writing has been rubbed out to make room for later writing, but where the traces of the earlier text remain, or a thing, like a building, say, much altered, but still bearing traces of its original form. And so it also describes, rather brilliantly, the British landscape. A thing much altered many times over, bearing not only traces of the original form, but of all the subsequent forms, each superimposed layer on layer, shaped by what came before and shaping what came after. So looked at like this, the landscape and its rivers as palimpsest, what on earth do we mean by river restoration? 
Which of these former states do we aspire to? And if we are hoping to create some kind of proto-wilderness, what about all these other layers in the landscape? What of the medieval channels to feed carp ponds, for example? Or those diversions dug to facilitate the construction of ancient priories? What of water meadows or mill streams? Doesn't each layer in the landscape form its own discrete and complex mix of history and ecology? There's an ancient water meadow at Ovington in Hampshire on the upper river Itchen, which has not been altered or improved, has seen no fertilizer and no plow, and only light grazing for the past 300 years or so. It is of historical interest, but it is one of the richest ecological sites on the whole river. In one part, this is because it is a man-made water meadow, and in another, because it has been left alone since it became one. It is the preservation of one tier of the palimpsest, era of water meadows. Reaching back further in time, the functioning mill lead and flood channel must once have created a modified ecology comparable to water meadows. The languorous flow of the lead, the deep swirling mill pool, the faster water below, and the original meandering river managed as a flood relief channel. Deep water, fast water, slow water, shallow water. A rich diversity of habitat created as a byproduct of the milling process. Most chalk streams are punctuated by as many mills as their gradient and flow allowed and have been for many centuries. And yet now, the mills present a more ambiguous legacy. Stagnant leads are filled with silt that we then wash downstream, and the re relief channels, the original rivers, have been left to choke up and dry out. The era of milling is of an arguable historical interest, but the unused milling structures left behind often impoverish habitat when once they might have enriched it. If the original parchment of our chalk rivers was the diverse natural ecology of the landscape left behind by retreating glaciers and evolved by a warming world over the millennia and centuries since, then each subsequent imprint has subtly or greatly altered that ecology. Many changes have been benign, and the influence of some others, as in the mills, has changed over time. Certainly, until the mid-20th century, and notwithstanding the mills and water meadows, estate lakes and ornamental cascades, the ecological diversity of our chalk rivers had not been greatly compromised, even if it had been subtly and variously changed. Waterside land was dedicated either to summer pasture or haymaking, or being too unproductive to farm and difficult to drain, was left as wet woodland and marsh. But two recent imprints have much more drastically modified the gently nuanced palimpsest we'd inherited by the middle of the last century. In the decades following the Second World War, a drive towards agricultural intensification and efficiency almost erased the weapons of southern England. Farmers were subsidised per acre in production, or per head of livestock, and through the 50s, 60s and 70s, diggers became the new dinosaurs of the landscape. Chalk streams were lost behind banks of spoil, quite literally turned on their heads. Through dredging and channelization, through wringing out of the wetlands, water meadows were modified to take higher densities of livestock or to grow wheat, and vast tracts of formerly uncultivated land were brought into production. The entrenched chalk stream, now lost in deep canyons, has been doubly hit by abstraction. Bloated and uniform channels carry half their natural flow. Sometimes they dry up altogether. A moving essay called The Passing of a River, published in Blackwoods magazine in 1947, describes how the upper few miles of the River Kennet were dried up by abstraction after only one public water supply pump had been installed. During dry summers in Norfolk, flows on the River Nile are more or less cut in half by abstraction. And the situation is getting worse year after year as actual abstraction moves ever closer to licensed abstraction. If those, who, if those two lines ever meet, there won't be a river in dry summers. But these dredged and abstracted rivers also represent a tier of the palimpsest. And so the restoration of such a complicated canvas deserves as much consideration as the restoration of an old painting or a listed building. 
What are we restoring away from? And what towards? And what is it okay to erase in the act of restoration? Because there's a danger that in restoring to rivers the ecological richness they have lost through dredging and abstraction, we erase previous more benign historical imprints. And there's also a danger that we replace them with arbitrary or subjective interpretations of a more desirable state, only to realize with hindsight that what we considered restoration was just another tier of modification, and an inelegant one at that. Think, for example, of the kinds of constructions, and I'm as guilty as anyone here because I've done them, we sometimes impose on rivers in the name of restoration, gravel riffles that rise and fall at neat angles of graded made of graded layers of stone, remeander curves that are unconvincingly uniform, graded banks and revetments that run from meadow to river at an even slant. These are constructions that suit design software and bills of measures and flood risk assessment pro forma, but not necessarily rivers. A river is alive and dynamic and most importantly, self-managing entity. So what is, what is it that we should aim to overcome in the act of river restoration? The answer, I think, must be only the man-made limits to that dynamism and capacity for self-management. The act of restoration ought to begin and end with that aspiration, not so much an imposition of structure as an unbridling of process. So dredging and abstraction are the two intertwined modifications that are between them imprisoned our chalk streams like never before, that have divorced them from the riverine process. Chalk streams, you see, are very, very low energy rivers. They've evolved over millennia inside valleys carved by forces which have long since left the landscape. A chalk stream is therefore particularly vulnerable to modification because this side of another ice age, it will never have the energy to overcome, to erase that modification. So this is why we have to be especially careful with restoration structures. But it's also why the dredged river, the dredged chalk stream, is locked in and will never escape. And why of all the modifications visited on chalk streams over the centuries, the era of dredging and abstraction was and still is by far the most damaging. A dredged chalk stream of diminished flows can only rise and fall within the confines of the man-made channel. It cannot deposit where it needs to, it cannot erode where it needs to. Its riparian and in-stream plant community is impoverished and restricted, and so are its flows, and so is its ecology. We've got to put that picture up. This is supposed to be up all along. <laughs> but never mind, it's relevant now. <laughs> This is a restored bit of the, of, of the River Nile, um, and it relates to this final point. I've been lucky enough to see at first hand unmodified spring-fed streams in other much less busy parts of the world, in New Zealand and Patagonia and Iceland and Bhutan. What has always struck me about these rivers and what they have in common with the comparatively unspoiled parts of short streams I've seen in England is a very simple spatial relationship between water level and ground level. Put simply, they've never been dredged. And because of this, they function like a river. A natural short stream flows close to bank height, and in that way, it relates to the land which surrounds it. That close relationship, call it connectivity, creates the riparian community that allows a river to breathe, which is what we try to recreate on this stretch of the River Nile to expand in winter, shrink in summer, to meander, to erode and deposit. To be, in other words, the live, dynamic, self-managing system that we ought to want at the heart of our landscape. In chalk stream restoration, therefore, I strongly believe we should most of all look to ways of reuniting the stream with a living riparian margin. And if we restore that connectivity, we will restore the riverine process and if we restore the riverine process, the river will restore itself. Thank you.